welcome. Welcome to our studios. Thank you. Great to be with you. There's a, a different, very, very good reason for you to be here, to move the world. You're an economist. And also our Turkish audience also know you as the teacher of Nuria Rubini and also the, as a consultant advisor to the UN. Um, so being an economist and having written the New York Times best-selling books, The Price of Civilization and of Poverty, all about economy, the world welfare. And now we have this book, JFK's Speech. What made you write this book? We're at the 50th anniversary of this incredible historic accomplishment <coughs> of President Kennedy. You know, 50 years ago was the height of the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis had just occurred. It looked like the world was going to blow itself up, and JFK found a way to make peace. And of course, I've loved that part of history because it uh, not only saved us and saved the planet, but showed leadership in its finest form. Uh, President Kennedy gave a great speech on June 10, 1963, 50 years ago at American University. It's called his peace speech. Mm -hmm. So I started with the idea of writing about the speech, but from that came the better understanding on my part about how that speech fit into an entire strategy to pull back from the precipice of nuclear war and find a way to make peace between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And President Kennedy did it. And it teaches a lot. It inspires us till today. Uh, people should listen to this great speech at American University. And my book tries to put that in historical perspective. Mm. And in fact, I must mention this to our audience. I had the honor of coming to your house and listening to JFK's speeches with you and I realized and as you pointed out at the end of all those great speeches that I was really impressed by and affected by he gave the definition new definitions to the meaning of peace right peace has different definitions and in fact you said three different yes. definitions and you even wrote here uh, I saw it at the uh, I think in the back world peace yes. was defined by JFK can you tell us about that well what he was saying to Americans in 1963 was we can make peace even with uh, a counterpart that seems like an implacable foe because the idea for Americans make peace with the Soviet Union it seems crazy at the time and today to Americans make peace with Iran or uh, to Israelis make peace with Palestine and Kennedy said yes you know your counterpart they're human beings they also want peace. You have to listen to them. Uh, they are not uh, some irrational, wild mob. Uh, they are human beings. They have the, the same interest in, in peace. And the American people kind of sat up and, and took notice. And in this great peace speech, he defines peace in three different ways. Beautiful. First, he says that peace is the rational end of rational men. What does he mean by that? He says, if we think about the situation that we're in, both sides aiming to kill each other or being so defensive, but rationally, we're in the same situation. We're uh, in a prisoner's dilemma, so-called. So we have to find rationally a way to solve our mutual interests. That was one. Then he says, peace isn't going to come by one magic step. Uh, it's not a matter of signing one agreement, uh, somehow solving all problems. He's, he says in his second definition, peace is a process, a way of solving problems. And he talked about the step-by-step -step approach to peace. And the third, he comes at the end of the speech and says, but after all, isn't peace just a basic human right, mm -hmm. the right to live out our lives as we would like to live them in safety, the right to have the confidence that our children will be able to live their lives. Uh, and he says, uh, in, in effect, this is uh, our God-given right, that we have a right to peace. Uh, it is a human right. And he raises it to an even higher level of uh, basic human need and human drive. Now, when he gave that speech, so unusual uh, for a presidential speech, uh, also because he didn't say 
okay, Soviet Union, you have eight points, and I make this demand, this demand, this that's demand. Right. That's how a president would normally talk, isn't it? That's right. Uh, and that's how uh, most sides would say, okay, well, you know, we have these demands. You reduce your troops. You do this. Kennedy, it's, it's incredible, actually, to uh, think about the way he really put it. And I'll just read one, one section uh, for you because I think it's, we just haven't heard this kind of attitude uh, before. Uh, he says, some say that it is useless to speak of peace or world law or world disarmament and that it will be useless until the leaders of the Soviet Union adopt a more enlightened attitude. I hope they do. I believe we can help them to do it. But I also believe that we must re-examine our own attitudes as individuals and as a nation, for our attitude is as essential as theirs. Now, how many times does a leader say, say that. It let's think about our own approach. approach? Amazing. You know, frankly, before this speech and after it, I don't know of another president that took this approach. But it was so filled with empathy, so filled with understanding of the other side that when Nikita Khrushchev, the chairman of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Kennedy's counterpart, heard the speech, he immediately summoned the U.S. envoy in Moscow, hmm. Avril Harriman. He said to Harriman, memorable words, that speech is the finest speech of an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. I want to make peace with that man. Hmm. Seven weeks later, the partial nuclear test ban treaty was initialed in Moscow. It's incredible to me. You know, this had been uh, an attempt to negotiate with the Soviet Union over a dozen years, always coming up with nothing, always falling short, one side putting up obstacles, the other side putting up obstacles. And then, I think partly by virtue of the speech, partly by virtue of the fact that Khrushchev and Kennedy understood each other. They had both peered into the abyss in the Cuban Missile Crisis. They cleared the obstacles. They said, we are going to sign an agreement. As soon as it was signed, the world whew, you know, breathed an incredible sigh of relief. By the time that the treaty was put into place, just a few weeks after that, 90 countries mm. had signed up to it. In other words, it gripped the imagination of the world to say we are moving in a different direction. We do not uh, have to be gripped by these forces uh, leading to our mutual destruction. We can find a different way forward. It is indeed incredible while you were talking about this, the agreement was signed right away. I cannot imagine how you can gauge the econo economic and the social impact of this speech. And one speech can do that. Is it him or is it also the Speechwriter, I remember you mentioned that of course. you also had interaction with you had yes. you you met him. Well, I knew him. You he knew was him. a friend. Kennedy's closest advisor, sometimes called his alter ego, and also formally his counselor and his speechwriter was Theodore Sorensen, a great man, one of the greatest phrase makers uh, in in the U.S. history, uh, and. Theodore Sorensen, of course, worked with Kennedy to draft this speech and several others that I refer to in the book. And Sorensen, uh, as a New Yorker, uh, was, was a neighbor of mine. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, a great man, a truly great man. Uh, and I talked to him a lot about this speech. He told me how much he valued this particular speech uh, among the greatest uh, uh, of I, I think it's fair to say his favorite among uh, Kennedy's speeches. Uh, and he told me how important he felt the speech was uh, for President Kennedy and for what he was trying to accomplish. And uh, I had dreamt that I would write a book talking with Ted Sorensen. How many times when I was writing this, I wanted to just go over there, sit down, and ask him questions. But alas, he had passed away. Oh, it's unfortunate. Well, we are talking about the economic impact of this, and I will bring us right now to today's world sure. because we need to ask you these questions as well. As you know, you know, the equity markets has been going up and down. All the markets have been affected by the Fed. Is it a speculation or is it really going to taper down the asset purchases? Is, are we coming to the end of QE3 really? Or is Bernanke acting and reacting towards the expectations? 
Well, Bernanke has been saying that this would go on as long as it's needed to get unemployment considerably lower than it is today. So oddly, when the unemployment rate ticked up, the markets jumped. Ah, more QE. Uh, and so, of course, this is uh, par for the course. Uh, people uh, in the financial markets want to see monetary ease continue. Uh, but uh, Bernanke doesn't uh, carry uh, the whole uh, board with him so simply because there are risks uh, to quantitative easing and another bubble, uh, more misallocation uh, in the economy. People are worried about it, and I think rightly so. So there will be a tapering off, but just the mention of it, of course, uh, had, had caused a downturn. Uh, the idea that it's going to be prolonged a jump of the market. Markets are highly sensitive to this right now, Extremely obviously. Extremely sensitive, and volatility we see a lot nowadays. Absolutely. Do you think if it happens, if Fed really gets out, there, if there's an exit, we, are we going to see a huge uh, total sell-off, just like Rubini mentioned, actually, in the emerging markets? Because everyone is looking at all over the markets, and emerging markets are especially nervous about this. Should they be nervous? Would you expect a total sell-off? <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect a total sell-off because I would expect that markets could look ahead and listen a little bit more carefully, but I'm constantly <laughs> d disappointed about that fact. You know, I'm not sure that they will. Just the mere announcement uh, that maybe sometime later this year there would be a tapering off, uh, of course, made a major uh, correction in, in Japan in the last week. I was in Tokyo last week, and, and uh, markets reacted very, very sharply and very negatively. And here as well. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, well, thank you. Great to talk to you about this, and I, I really appreciate pleasure. it. A pleasure. And this is a beautiful book, by the way. After the Price of Civilization and of Power, I have those books too. I'm almost halfway. I can't wait to finish this. I am moved, but I was especially moved by the speeches itself. You're right. Everyone should listen to it as well because he puts the Absolutely. emotions. Absolutely. Listen to it. Read the book. Learn the history. Admire the leadership. And then let's ask the question, how can we get that leadership today? today? We got a lot of problems today that we need to solve. We need leadership now. Well, that's a great question we need to ask all of ourselves. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure, Professor Sachs. Thank you. Great to be with you. It's a secret. It's the Istanbul.